Welcome to our study of the book of Exodus. The family of the patriarchs went into Egypt, but they come out as a nation. It's a record of the birth of the nation Israel from its beginning and its unique role in God's program for all of us. An exciting book. It includes so many fundamental things, the law, the tabernacle, all kinds of macro codes. The one of the discoveries you'll make is that Jesus Christ is on every page. A foundational book for all of us. We hope you really enjoy it. If I said to you, one of the greatest things God has done is a creation, right? The creation. How many books of the Bible are devoted to the topic of the creation? One, I think we generally figure the book of Genesis captures it. I mean, there's obviously, it's addressed elsewhere, but that's the primary focus of that book and probably the only book that focuses on it. My proposition to you tonight that there's another act of God that is more profound, more important than his creation. Now you all know you're in the right room. This is heresy 1A, right? <laughs> Redemption, right on, right on. Redemption is greater than creation in many respects, but I'll just go at it simply. How many books of the Bible are essentially devoted to the subject of the redemption? 66. Okay, well, 66, that's a cute answer, except that's, uh, that's fair, that's fair. But in a specific sense, I've got to argue that the book of Revelation, the issue in the book of Revelation is the redemption. Behold, I see a new heaven and a new earth. All that Christ paid for and took title to, he then takes possession of, and that's what the book's all about, redemption. Good. A predecessor book anticipating it, the book of Joshua. A structural model of the book of Revelation in many respects. If that's a new idea to you, I commend you the Joshua studies. They're fascinating for that reason, if none other. The book of Ruth, the romance of redemption, without which... If you don't understand the book of Ruth, you can't fully appreciate what's going on in the book of Revelation. But then, in an anticipatory sense, which book of the Bible is really the book of redemption? Exodus. Good guess. Good answer. <laughs> so we, by this logic, came to take the book of Exodus as a book of prophecy. Now, if I was just going to go through the books and say, gee, I'm sort of in the mood to do a prophetic study and I was interested in doing something Old Testament, I would be hard-pressed to find a book that is more full of prophecies. Of prophecies. The book of Exodus. That seems surprising. The book of Exodus is going to be startling in its unveiling of detail. The burning bush the Bacacia the bush burning in the desert that Moses takes fascination of next week. The thorns introduced as a symbol of the curse worn on the brow of Jesus Christ, a flame, and yet not being consumed. The flame being the hands of the living God, but not being consumed. What is that as a model of? The model of grace. It's always grace that draws us, not his righteousness, and that's what drew Moses, and we're going to get into that next week. But we move on through the, the thing. Of course, we have the plagues of Egypt. Fascinating, fascinating study of the plagues of Egypt. Anticipatory, of course, of, the, of you might, what you might call the plagues of the book of Revelation. We have the, the role of firstborn. We have that greatest of feasts in many respects, the feast of Passover introduced. And uh, you say, well, gee, feast of Passover, that's terrific. Of the great seven feasts of Moses. Passover starts it off, feast of unleavened bread, right? Feast of first fruits, the first three, referring into the, coming in the first month, first coming. Then we have the Feast of Pentecost, or weeks, if you will, a symbol of the church, presumably, anticipatory. The last three of the seven are in the seventh month of the ecclesiastical year, if I can phrase it that way, namely the, uh, excuse me, uh, Rosh Hashanah is the new, uh, the new year, the Feast of uh, Trumpets, uh, Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles. The seven Mosaic feasts, all of them prophetic. The first three is first coming, the last three is second coming, and of course the church between. Very interesting model. We'll touch upon that. We get to the Feast of Passover, which everybody knows is a Levitical feast. Wrong. How interesting it is. All the Levitical feasts are given by whom? The high priest, not Passover. 
everyone in the household. It's not a Levitical feast, incidentally, for a lot of interesting reasons we'll come to. So as we begin to understand this, we then we get to the big, big deal, in my mind, and that's the tabernacle, where every detail, every piece of material, every dimension, every subtlety of its erection, its taking down, its moving, its care, speaks of one thing. We could, in our notepad, put Psalm 119, 162. Psalm 119, as you all know, is the longest psalm. 162 is a verse which says, And behold, in, your wor in thy word I findeth great spoil. We're going into a feast, the Feast of Exodus. And uh, that's really sort of the mood I think we can at attack it in. Paul tells us in the book of Romans, chapter 15, verse 4, Whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, Right? that we through the patience and the comfort of the scriptures might have hope. He didn't say most things. He didn't say over half of them or a lot of them. Whatsoever things were written aforetime. Now, you may think I'm an extremist, and you're probably close to the truth because I'm probably a, a nut on this regard, but I happen to hold the view that every detail, every number, every place name is engineered by the Holy Spirit and has meaning has a significance beyond the, the local historical event. Many of those I haven't found, so I wouldn't, you know, I'm not saying I can prove my theory. I can see enough of it to convince me that that's true in the general case. And of course, as we go through the, the Bible, you can find central themes to every book. We spoke of Genesis as the book of creation more precisely. Rather than call it the book of the creation, you'd call it the book of beginnings. Many things begin in Genesis. In fact, everything that's begun in Genesis is climax in the book of Revelation. And that's an interesting study in its own right. You can get the Revelation notes or the Genesis notes to tie that together. Doctrinally, in a doctrinal sense, the book of Genesis focuses on the concept of election. And we find uh, Shem elected out of the sons of Noah. We find Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. J Isaac is chosen over Ishmael, Jacob over Esau. Joseph from among the 12 tribes, and then Ephraim over Manasseh. In each of those cases, it's the youngest over the older. The idea of the firstborn is introduced, but God's sovereignty at establishing his own prerogatives are well visible in the book of Genesis. In fact, turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. My question to you is, when were you created? I would argue that you take your age and add nine months or something, you can get to the point what we call, I think, medically conception, right? Prior to that, you, your existence, I suspect, at least you, as you and I would think of it, is theological only. So I'm going to argue that you were created in the sense of being born or conceived X years ago, something under 100 for most of you. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. Paul says, but we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord. Why? Because God hath what? From the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. And on, on he goes. One of dozens of verses which suggest that your election, and what's that election for? To be conceived? To be to created? No. The election that appoints you to the redemption that he has laid down before the foundation of the world. That's an idea that it goes far beyond God redeeming Israel out of Egypt, out of bondage. We're going to dwell, we're, we're going to shortly get plunged right into, you know, the whole scene of the, the very familiar story of the, of the bondage and the trials and, and God appointing a deliverer to get them out of there. And that's going to be very dramatic. It's going to have many lessons practically. But the issue is far, far more profound. Its impact on the universe is far more profound than simply this nation that God has chosen to establish and redeem. Uh, as we go through the, the Torah, Leviticus, of course, deals with work. Exodus does, of course, deals with redemption. Leviticus, worship, numbers, the walk, and Deuteronomy, the warfare of the wilderness. The worship in Leviticus, the walk, the Christian's walk in the book of Numbers, Christian's warfare in Deuteronomy is one way, perhaps, to put emphasis on those particular things. Focusing on the book of Exodus, to give you a brief outline of what's coming, we're going to see our need for redemption in the first six chapters. Chapters 1 through 6 will focus on our need for redemption, that is, our enslavement. In Israel's case, they were enslaved to Egypt. In our case, we're enslaved to what? Sin. 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 
We're going to see in chapters 7 through 11 God's might, his ability to perform the redemption through the plagues and all of that. We're going to see him specifically engineer the situation so as to provide a theater to demonstrate his power. Who hardened Pharaoh's heart? Why? That he might show himself strong. And we'll look into all that as we get there. The character of redemption, that is the blood purchase, strange idea, is not ordained in Exodus. It's ordained in Eden. Remember Adam and Eve, God made them coats of skins from animals, that they should be covered, not by their own handiwork, but by the shedding of innocent blood. The so-called Levitical system started there. However, in the book of Exodus, it gets ordained and established in a regulatory uh, sense. I think it's important for us to bear in mind that many of those concepts and things that were embodied in the ordinances that we'll get into were actually ordained in Eden, reestablished here. And we'll deal with that as we get there. We'll see the duty that redemption implies in terms of obedience, chapters 19. The character is 12 through 18, blood purchase, the duty from chapters 19 through 24. And perhaps most reassuring for all of us, his provision for our failures. His provision for our failures in chapters 25 through 40, the subject of which is the tabernacle. The tabernacle was established for Israel as a recognition that they'd stumble. It was a place for the cleansing and the reestablishment of fellowship. And that's exactly where you and I are. Who's our tabernacle? Jesus Christ. Okay, so a couple of other things before we jump in. Uh, uh, many of the scholars like to make a big deal of the appearance of the number two in the scripture. Number two can mean several things. It usually implies a difference or division. Just like in the second day in Genesis, he divided the waters. The number two can represent witness to a two men agree. And we're going to see all kinds of witnesses uh, of, of things in the book of Exodus. It also implies two things in opposition to one another. That is, in the sense of a rhetorical contrast. We think of Cain and Abel, Jacob and Esau, Moses and Aaron, David and Solomon. You can almost, as you go through the scripture, when you see two things in juxtaposition with one another, you're almost always right if you jump to the conclusion that the Holy Spirit's put them side by side to show you something, a contrast, one with the other. Cain and Abel, we study that in Genesis, very interesting contrast. Jacob and Esau, dramatic conference. Moses and Aaron we're going to unfold as we get into this book, and of course David and Solomon we've talked about in the past and so on. We're going to see this concept dividing underlying Pharaoh, and I don't mean to be doing a bad pun, but we'll see it where he's dividing the babes. We're going to see that he orders a division, in effect. We find that the Lord, with the plagues, severing in that day, severing Israel from Egypt, separating them before the plagues come. Remember, to separate, calling them separate, focusing the plagues of various kinds on only the Egyptian elements, the Egyptian cattle or the Egyptian whatever. Plagues in chapter 8, the cattle in chapter 9, the Red Sea's divided in chapter 14. The veil is, is a de designed to divide the holy place from the holy of holies. That only occurs in Exodus in chapter 26. And, of course, we see the ultimate dividing of the veil in Matthew when uh, our Lord was crucified. This question of the opposition, one of the things that I would like you to develop a sensitivity for is the lessons we learned out of Revelation chapter 12. And we won't take the time now to review it because we'll review it as we go. But that's the whole issue of who the adversary is, what his game plan is, uh, Revelation chapter 12 is where we see the woman with 12 stars, sun and the moon. And that idiom is explained for us, fortunately, by Joseph in his dreams in Genesis. It's just the only place the 12 stars occur, and the sun and the moon represent even Jacob himself, who recognizes Joseph's idiom as referring to the nation Israel. The woman, of course, is going to give birth to a man-child. The man-child, of course, is Jesus Christ. But the dragon, who is identified in chapter 12, verse 5, is our adversary. His whole program is to wipe out God's plan to, to establish the man-child. That plan started in Eden with the serpent, continued with Cain slaying Abel, and you can go through the scripture from cover to cover and see every act adverse to God's plan as an engineered move by Satan to try to disrupt the royal line. And we're going to see it in Exodus rather dramatically. We're going to discover as we unfold the book of Exodus that it becomes a model 
in a much broader mystical sense. Certainly there really was a pharaoh, there really was Israel, really in bondage and all of that. But we're going to discover both in fact in a mystical sense, but also in a rhetorical sense, the Holy Spirit's going to use that situation to speak to us of a number of other things. We will generally identify ourselves with Israel because that's the theme of the story, that's who we're going to identify with. Israel is God's chosen people. Where do they find themselves? In bondage. Bondage to what? Sin. Where are they located? In Egypt. We're going to discover that Egypt becomes a type or a model of the world. Israel becomes a type of the believer, enslaved by sin. We'll find Pharaoh cast in the role or the model of our adversary, Satan. We'll see coming on the scene Moses as God's appointed deliverer, who brings them out of there. We're going to discover a lot of interesting things about this, and as we, we also now can look in another sense prophetically, I'm going to suggest to you that the book of Exodus is a foreshadowing of another Exodus. I'm going to suggest to you that the bondage and the affliction of Israel in Exodus is not the worst that they'll ever see. What's my authority? Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, quoting from the book of Daniel, chapter 12. Peter, James, and John, and Andrew came together, asked him, well, how are we going to know when you're coming back? And he gave them a confidential briefing, Matthew 24 and 25, the so-called Olivet Discourse. In there, he mentions, speaking of the abomination of desolation, all these things yet future, he says there will be a time of trouble for Israel, such as the world had never seen to that day, nor ever would see again. That includes Egypt. It also includes Germany. That's yet future. Unless those days were, would be shortened, there would be no, no flesh saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Well, we'll get into that when the time comes. But recognize this Exodus has some very practical lessons. We're going to discover some bizarre things about the book of Exodus. We're going to discover that Pharaoh had some magicians. And these magicians could simulate the same miracles that Moses was invoking by the power of God up until a very peculiar limit. There's a very strange plague that shakes the priests up, and we'll get there. But the interesting thing for us that we can easily miss, it's very, very foolish for us to jump to the conclusion that the power of those magicians was parlor games. It's also interesting that there were two of them, and their names are preserved throughout eternity, Janus and Jammers, in uh, 2 Timothy 3.8, but that's another whole thing. Um, Let's talk about the contrast. This is all by way of introduction. These are what I, what I do is I dump all the notes that don't fit anywhere else and give it to you the first. Um, let's contrast Genesis. In one sense, the book of Exodus supports the book of Revelation. In the other case, it's right after Genesis, so we should say Genesis. Actually, we should contrast the two. Genesis is the story of a family, Adam through Joseph. The family has begun. It's really most of it's Abraham and following. Exodus is the birth of a nation. We'll consult scripture and show that God regards Israel as born, as a nation that's born in Egypt. Abraham is a story of a few, and of course, Exodus is a story of millions. Most scholars estimate the nation Israel leaving through the Red Sea were numbered about two million. That may shatter your views of this little band. You've got to recognize even DeMille had a limit in this cast of <laughs> extras. But there are estimates that go into a couple of million. When in Genesis, um, they were welcomed and honored as they came into Egypt. And of course, in Exodus, they're feared and hated. In Genesis, Pharaoh knows God. Chapter 41, verse 39 mentions that. And of course, obviously, a Pharaoh that knew not the Lord is what we're dealing with in, in Exodus. In Genesis, the lamb was promised. Remember chapter 22. In Exodus, the lamb was slain. Of course, Genesis is the entry to Egypt, and Exodus is the flight from Egypt. In Genesis, we dream of a land of milk and honey, and of course, in Exodus, we find them in the wilderness. And of course, Genesis closes with Joseph in a coffin in Egypt. In Exodus, we see the glory of the Lord revealed in the tabernacle. We're going to find in the scripture there are models or types, ideas introduced with, with a specific intention of teaching us something broader. We'll find in, in the book of Exodus, we'll find types or models. Israel, of course, will, in a sense, model ourselves. We'll learn many lessons, both of our predicament, what God has provided to deal with that, and what we need to do as a response to that. We'll find that Egypt models the world. And uh, that's where we are before grace, is in the world. 
right? That's where Israel was. The Pharaoh will represent our adversary, the enemy, Satan, who is the ruler of what? Egypt. Who is the ruler of this world? Satan, according to Paul. And we're in bondage, Israel to Egypt, but we are in bondage to sin. We'll speak of a deliverer, Moses. In many respects, Moses is going to be a surprising model or type of Christ. And we'll deal with many of these, many of these you've heard. He was obviously foreknown. He had a miraculous uh, supervision of his staying alive as a birth. The whole slaughter of the babes in Bethlehem, the slaughter of the babes by Pharaoh, very parallel. And, of course, he's called upon to deliver his people, just exactly what Jesus Christ was called upon to do, both in terms of suffering for us, but also coming as a ruling conqueror to take possession when the time comes. When uh, Moses goes to Midian, how many daughters does the priest of Midian have? Seven, right? How interesting. How many churches does Christ to deal with in Revelation? Uh, does he take one of these as a bride? I'll point out to you, by the way, Midian would make it a Gentile bride, but I won't push the issue here. We'll get to that there at time. So we're going to find interesting things that may not be relevant. Some of these things are cute but may not be meaningful. I'm going to leave it to you to decide as we go. And, of course, we'll have uh, all kinds of other things. The Passover is going to deal with our role as the believer. In fact, the Passover gives rise to the title that John the Baptist introduced Jesus Christ in public with. Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. What do you mean? He meant a Passover lamb. Coming, going back to this. We, we need to really understand the Passover. And, of course, we have the deliverance from the yoke of bondage. We have the crossing of the Red Sea. We're going to have some very particular types of Christ in the book. Moses will be a type of Christ, in a sense. The burning bush will be a type of Christ, in a sense. The Passover lamb, clearly a type of Christ in many senses. The crossing of the Red Sea, strangely enough, will be a type of Christ, providing life to some and death to others. Manna is going to be a type of Christ. I am the bread of life. One of his famous seven, one of the seven discourses that make up the Gospel of John is a type of Christ. The smitten rock. And, of course, perhaps the greatest type of Christ, the tabernacle itself. Let's jump into Exodus chapter 1. Exodus, obviously, is one of the five books of Moses, or the Pentateuch, as it's sometimes called, or the Torah, if you're of Jewish or Israeli background. Um, the five books of Moses. Now, there's been much said. I might, I like to get this out of the way, too. Uh, you'll run across, if you haven't now, you will run across someday a thing called the documentary hypothesis. That's a fancy name for a theory that became very popular among certain German scholars and, and has received a lot of attention since. Many Protestant churches today that are otherwise relatively literate still embrace the documentary hypothesis, and it's tragic. The documentary hypothesis attempts to describe the five books of Moses as written by other people. <laughs> They notice certain distinguishing characteristics of the text, and they attribute part of this to an Elohist, a Jehovahist, a priestly document, J-E-P, and you get a whole bunch of different letters, meaning which sections, which of these ancient scribes really wrote, and you get into this whole trip. The interesting thing is that Jesus Christ knew better. Jesus Christ quoted from each of the five books of Moses and attributed it to Moses. So if you're a Christian, you can save yourself a lot of trouble. The documentary hypothesis is not only unscholarly, having good, ample rebuttal by good seminary research, but more importantly than that, it is an anathema to a fundamentalist believer because it'll, it creates doubt where you don't need doubt. This whole area of textual criticism is something I don't have a lot of room for because in my Christian development, I fell prey to not so much accepting the hypothesis as having it create just enough cloud in my mind to prevent me from seeing God's handiwork. And uh, I was delighted to discover that not only does Jesus Christ totally devastate the uh, documentary hypothesis, but our friend John in John chapter 12 also devastates the two Isaiah theory by conveniently quoting from Isaiah 1 and Isaiah 2 and attributing both to the same Isaiah. And the Holy Spirit specifically putting those things in there for the believing Christian. So one of the things that I just enjoy is the enormous labor-saving device of having some faith in the Word. The best commentary, the best commentary on the Scripture is the Scripture itself, and I'm going to show you a dramatic example of that in these first couple of chapters. You can go through libraries and libraries where there's speculation on which pharaoh was the pharaoh in Egypt under Moses. 
And there's a lot of research about that. I'm not going to take quarrel with any one thing. The main point I'm going to try and show you tonight is that he wasn't an Egyptian. And that'll be kind of fun, but let's wait till we get there. All right. Let's back up. Before we jump into the text, why did God, why did God allow them to be so cruelly treated? Why is Israel in this predicament in the first place? First of all, uh, you can say, that, well, it's to prepare them for their inheritance. God has got them in this crucible of Egypt to shape them. And bring, they, they win as a family and they come out as a nation. That's a reasonable, reasonably good answer. The other thing I want to remind you, you students of Genesis, is that this program was laid out long before there even was a Joseph to take him there in the first place. Genesis chapter 15, verse 16. We might find that interesting to refresh our memory. Let's start maybe a little earlier. This is where there's this very peculiar covenant made with Abraham. Verse 13 of chapter 15, And he said unto Abraham, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a sojourner in a land that is not theirs, and they shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterward shall they come out with great substance. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace, thou shalt be buried in a good old age. That he's speaking, not Ab Abram. But in the fourth generation, they shall come here again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. And it's come to pass that when the sun went down, it was dark, and so forth. We go into this whole thing of the covenant with Abram. Now, what's interesting here is that God predicts this whole thing to Abram, after which comes Isaac and Jacob and then his 12 sons and his whole intrigue that, with Joseph, and he gets sold into slavery and becomes the prime minister of Egypt. And for some 30 years, they prosper. And that leads to the thing we're going to take on in Exodus. In the fourth generation, they shall come here again. Let's see, he's talking to Abram, right? Isaac, Jacob, then the 12 tribes, which would be what, the tribe of Levi, and we have what? Moses and Aaron. Four. Gee, he was about right. This whole idea of the Amorites' iniquity not being full is interesting. You can, those of you that want to dig into it, Matthew 23, verse 32, and 1 Thessalonians 2, 16 are two other references which speaks to the unbeliever that there's a certain amount of sin that gets their ledger full. It's a very strange idea, but those who want to track it can go to Matthew 23, 32, and 1 Thessalonians 2, 16, and I'll leave it for now. Okay. Um, some other things that's interesting is that you'll notice that there's a basic principle God has that what man reaps, he shall sow. Joseph's brothers were to be punished for their treatment of Joseph. To what, the third and fourth generation? How interesting. Genesis 15, verse 7 to 17, if you want to get into that, let's talk about Jesus Christ. Christ was remanded by Israel into the hands of the Gentiles. What has happened to Israel in the diaspora? Christ was cut off. Israel in 70 A.D. was cut off. You can go through a whole study of that. If it's interesting, you can run with that on your own. We're going to get into a whole thing with Egypt all the way through this. Let me sort of up front talk a little bit about Egypt, what Egypt's all about. Egypt is the world. Do you remember the promise that Satan gave Eve in the garden? If you eat of this fruit, ye shall what? Ye shall be as gods, right? That statement's a very interesting statement. Uh, most of us take it in a primitive sense. You can also look at it in a reflexive sense. Ye shall be as gods, meaning ye sh you're going to worship yourselves. That statement is equivalent to saying, instead of worshiping the Most High, ye shall be as gods, that is, it's not as if you'll be gods that others will worship. It's that you'll worship yourselves. And in that lies its own folly. One of the great tragedies of Western culture, or our civilization, is man's deification of himself. And it's one of the interesting things. As you develop spiritual sensitivity brought on by understanding of his word, you're going to become increasingly sensitive to the fact how man will extol his own achievements and put himself in the, in the person of man worship. It's interesting that that was also very visible in Egypt. It's also interesting, as far as Egypt's concerned, what came out of that, what is the primary contribution to literature 
out of the Egyptian culture. You've all heard of it, probably. It's called the Book of the Dead. The whole concept of life was the past tense kind of thing. And uh, there's science and art focused on death, not life. Their religion embalmed relics. They spoke of the life that had been in contrast to the guy who says, I am that I am, that was, that is, and forever will be. And we get to that, uh, where God introduced that idea. It's in contrast to the uh, religion of, of Egypt. Egypt deified its own lusts and passions, which is the same form of all heathen worship, and we'll see what God, how God deals with all of that. Uh, at this point, uh, let me stop with this stuff, and let's just jump into chapter 1, verse 1. Now these are the names of the children of Israel who came into Egypt. Every man and his household came with Jacob. Now, you should always be, those of you that are uh, refugees from our Genesis study, know when we were speaking positively about this son of Isaac, we would use the term, his new name, Israel. That's if he's in the spirit. If he's in the flesh, we speak of him as Jacob. And most of the time it's Jacob, right? <laughs> God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel? No. Every other person in the scripture has two names, and the new name is always used once it's given. So it's not Abraham, it's Abraham, right? Not Sarai, it's Sarah. You know, Peter Cephas is another example, probably. Saul to Paul. And you go all the way through all these name changes, except <laughs> Jacob is most of the time Jacob. Now and then Israel. Now, interestingly, they, 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 uh, they reside where? In Goshen, right? And the Goshen, incidentally, we know from Genesis 47, is the best part of the land we've, we learned from Genesis. Anyway, here it gives you the, the list of the sons that came, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, Benjamin, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. And all the souls that came out of the loins of Jacob were 70 souls, for uh, Joseph was in Egypt already. And Joseph died, and all his brethren, and all that generation. And the children of Israel were fruitful, increased abundantly, and multiplied, and became exceedingly mighty. And the land was filled with them. Now, it's estimated that roughly 30 years take place. This is by tying one of the most interesting commentaries on the Old Testament is Stephen's discussion in Acts chapter 7. Those of you that are trying to understand the Old Testament will find Stephen commenting a lot of fields in a lot of gaps for us. Acts 7, 6 and Exodus 12, 40 allows us to put together the fact there's about a 30-year period. And very simply, because we know there's a 430-year total, and 400 of these were in bondage, so 30 years weren't too bad. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who knew not Joseph. And he said unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come on, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply and come to pass, that when war occurs, they join also unto our enemies and fight against us, and so get them up out of the land. Okay, let's turn to Acts chapter 7 and take advantage of our friend Stephen, who's addressing the Sanhedrin, the leadership. Among that leadership, of course, there are scholars, and we learn a lot about the Old Testament from Stephen's rundown here. Okay. Now the Holy Spirit in verse 18, verse 17 refers to Abraham, how the people grew and multiplied in Egypt, right? Verse 18, it says, till another king arose who knew not Joseph. And it goes on, dealt craftily with our kindred and ill-treated our fathers and so forth. In which time Moses was born exceedingly fair and nourished up in his father's house three months. And when he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nourished him as her own son and so forth. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. And we'll come back to this because we're going to learn a lot about this from Stephen that isn't so clear from Exodus. But I want you to focus on verse 18. The Holy Spirit has done you a great favor. The Holy Spirit has given you a, a word in that verse, the word another. Now the English, another, isn't a very useful word. It can mean any of a lot of things. It just means another one. The Greeks, fortunately, had two different words. Heteros and alos. If you had another of the same kind, like, you know, I've got a pencil and I broke it, give me another. In other words, I want the same thing I had. I would use the word alos. If I need a writing instrument and you gave me a pencil, but I want a pen, I want another that is something different. I want heteros. Different word. In the Greek, you can tell more about what the sense of it is than in the English, because we use the word another in both senses. 
If I want another exactly like it, I say, I want another one. If you offer me a drink, but I want something different. I didn't want Coke, I wanted milk. Or I didn't want coffee, I wanted tea. I want another choice. But it's a, the concept I'm after is a different one. Guess which one Stephen uses? Heteros. Heteros. OK. Well, that's a clue, which should give you, you know, those of you that really have time on your hands and want to start looking for things, I'd like to call your attention to a very fascinating verse in Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 52. Those of you from the Isaiah study, of course, will remember it very well. Isaiah 52. It's a whole interesting passage here, frankly. Awake, awake, verse 1. Uh, put on thy strength, O Zion. Put on, my, put on thy beautiful garments of Jerusalem, the holy city. For henceforth there shall no more come unto thee the uncircumcised and the unclean. Shake thyself from the dust. Arise and sit down, O Jerusalem. Loose thyself from the bands of thy neck, O captive daughter of Zion. For thus saith the Lord, ye have sold yourselves for nothing, and ye shall be redeemed without money. We're going to understand what that means when we get through Exodus as to what redemption really requires. For thus saith the Lord God, my people went down at the first into Egypt to sojourn there, and the Assyrian oppressed them without cause. Oh, really? I thought he was Pharaoh. Right. But was he an Egyptian? No. Assyrian and, and Egyptian are different words in the Hebrew. Mitzrayim is the new word for Egypt, meaning like two straits. It refers to this two strips of land on each side of the Nile. It's the name for the for what's Egyptian, in contrast to Assyrian, which is a totally different bunch of guys, a bunch of roughnecks that are way, way up north and, and uh, eastward, the Assyrians. How interesting that is. What a strange little glimmer we get that we have a king now over Egypt, not by dynasty in terms of father-son arrangement, but apparently by conquest or some other arrangement that the Assyrians are in charge somehow. Is he Pharaoh? Yes. Is he in charge? Yes. Is he insecure? You bet. Now we get a whole different insight here. Let's read this now, recognizing he's a foreigner on this throne somehow. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who knew not Joseph and said unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come on, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply and it come to pass that when war occurs, they also join unto our enemies and fight against us, and so get them up out of the land. It's interesting, we can get a, perhaps a whole different insight as to why Pharaoh was very apprehensive about this growing constituency, if I can call them that, of Hebrews. Yes, they're slaves, but they're growing in numbers to the point where they may have a problem. And when you recognize that he may not be demographically or ethnically linked to the throne, but by force or other power, he's insecure. Interesting idea. Interesting insight. I am going to suggest to you that Scripture is the best interpretation of, of, of the Scripture. It's self-interpreting. Come on, let us deal wisely with them. I can't leave the word wisely without making this. What, what does 1 Corinthians say about taking the wise in their own craftiness? Here's the Pharaoh all worried about these guys, right? Before the chapter's over, we're going to discover God puts him in a position of providing board, lodging, and education to the very guy that's going to accomplish the very thing he's afraid of. <laughs> I think that's neat. Verse 11, Therefore they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens, and they built for Pharaoh treasure cities, Pithom and Ramesses. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. And that's always the way it is, isn't it? Same thing that Rome discovered that the more they tried to crush this upstart religion in the time of the, in the first century, the more it grew and spread. In fact, it was healthier when it was being persecuted than it was when uh, they had the so-called conversion in 312 AD. And they were grieved because of the children of Israel, and the Egyptians made the, made the children of Israel to serve with rigor, and they made their lives bitter with hard bondage in mortar and in brick and all manner of service in the field, and all their service wherein they made them serve was with rigor. It's emphasized so often, one can't dwell on this passage much without feeling a great deal of pain for what seemed to be hidden behind the strength of that language. And the king of Egypt spoke with the Hebrew midwives, of which the name of one was Shifra and the name of the other Puah. 
Now, that's a very interesting situation. There's obviously more than two midwives, but there's two of them singled out. Why two? Witnesses? Shifra, incidentally, happens to mean glisten, and pure means brilliance or glitter, as, as an aside. Anyway, he said to them, when ye do the office of the midwife to the Hebrew women and see them upon the stools, if it be a son, then ye shall kill him. But if it be a daughter, then she shall live. But the midwives feared God and did not as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the male children alive. And the king of Egypt called for the midwives and said unto them, Why have ye done this thing, and why have ye saved the male children alive? And the midwives said unto the Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not as Egyptian women, for they are lively and are delivered before the midwives come in unto them. <laughs> going gets tough, the tough get going or something. Yeah, right. <laughs> Therefore God dwelt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and became very mighty. And it came to pass, because the midwives feared God, that he gave them families. And Pharaoh charged all his people, saying, Every son that is born ye shall cast into the river, and every daughter ye shall save alive. Now we get to chapter 2, which introduces our friend Moses. Many scholars have made the remark that there's probably no other character between Adam and Christ than Moses. And we're going to see a very, very interesting guy surface here, and you might well pay all the attention you can to this to the role of this interesting, interesting person. Goes by the name of Moses. He's a child of a slave, becomes the son of a queen. He was born in a hut and he's raised in the palace. He inherited poverty, yet he enjoyed unlimited wealth. The leader of the armies becomes a keeper of flocks. The mightiest of warriors becomes the meekest of men. He was educated at the court, but he dwelt in the desert. He had the wisdom of Egypt and the faith of a child. He was fitted for the city, but wandered in the wilderness. He was tempted by the pleasures of sin, but endured the hardships of virtue. He was backward in his speech, yet he talked with God. He carried the rod of the shepherd, but behind it was the power of the infinite. He was a fugitive pharaoh, but an ambassador of heaven. He was a giver of law and the forerunner of grace. He died alone in Mount Moab, yet he appears with Christ in Judea. Matthew 17. No man assisted his funeral, but God himself buries him. He's also the only person in the scripture, apparently, in which the body was denied to Satan by none other than Michael. Jude gives us this weird hint at. Interesting guy. And if you've studied uh, Revelation chapter 11, it's my suggestion you haven't seen the last of him yet. <laughs> Verse, uh, chapter 2, And there went a man of the house of Levi and took to wife a daughter of Levi. The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw him that he was a beautiful child, she hid him three months. And when she could not longer hide him, she took for him an ark of bulrushes, daubed it with slime and with pitch, and put the child therein, and she laid it on the flags by the river's bank. And a sister stood far off to see what would be done to him. The daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself at the river. Her maidens walked along by the riverside. And when she saw the ark among the flags, she sent her maid to fetch it. And when she had opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the babe wept. She had compassion on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Then said his sister to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call a nurse of the Hebrew women, that she may nurse the child for thee? And the Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. And the maid went and called the child's mother, and Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse it for me, and I will give thee thy wages. And the woman took the child and nursed him. And the child grew, and she brought him unto Pharaoh's daughter, and she became her son. And she called his name Moses, or Moshe, actually. Moshe Dayan is perhaps the, the name we're used to. That's the proper. And she said, because I drew him out of the water. The word Moshe is very close to the word that means to draw Moshe, I mean to draw out of the water. Now, a couple of things. I want you to understand the bizarreness of this. You have, you're hiding in your hut and you have this child, right? And the, the establishment are out to get your child. And what are they going to do with him when they find him? Going to put him in a river to drown him. Would you, as a mother, take your child and hide him? Probably. Would you do it in the river? Not likely. <laughs> what a strange idea for these parents to take this child, put him in a basket, what we would call a basket. The word ark appears in verse 
5, the only place in uh, Exodus, and it also occurs in Genesis chapter 6 and 7. <laughs> the word pitch here is the Hebrew word kafar, which is translated every else other place in the Bible as the word for atonement. So we're getting some clues. It's, hey, something strange is going on. How did the parents of Moses know what to do? We get a clue from Hebrews Chapter 11, you all know the Hall of Faith, this chronicle of the great faithful in the Old Testament that the writer of the book of Hebrews uses to make his points, but sort of as summary points. But in verse 23, he makes reference to the parents of Moses. Hebrews 11, verse 23, By faith Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. Now we can read that and not capture the idea. What does Romans 10, 17 tell us about faith? Faith cometh by hearing. hearing. One can draw the inference from the writings of Paul in Romans chapter 10 and the writings of the writer of the book of Hebrews in chapter 11, verse 23, that Moses' parents did this by faith. It isn't a blind thing. It's a following of instruction kind of thing. The inference that I draw, let me just put it that way, is that unrecorded here was instruction to the parents to do exactly what they were told. And matter of fact, that's just God's way to do the highly unlikely. The highly unlikely. We speak, we, in fact, a very, very strange passage occurs in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Verse 19, for it's written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. And what better example than what we're going to see that Pharaoh stuck with? Uh, Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. For it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For Jews require a sign, the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews, a stumbling block, and unto the Gentiles, foolishness. But to them who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. And here's the strange verse. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. What a bizarre phrase, the foolishness of God. How can you, with any conception, any conception of God, speak of the foolishness of God? And the interesting, the greatest chronicle of God's foolishness is sitting in our laps, the Bible. What foolishness to have the entire known world saved from a flood. I mean, the, that which he wants to be saved, by putting him in a boat, a barge, these eight people. We can go through the whole scripture, item by item by item. Every example in the scripture where God uses some strange, strange thing to accomplish his purpose. Not the least of which is Moses here taking this basket to save him and put him in the river, the very place that the soldiers would be drowning the babe if they found him. And, and we can chronicle God's dealing with man all the way through, item after item after item. And in the interest of time, I won't try to chronicle each one, but you can go through the scripture yourself, the, through these bizarre Old Testament stories where God will have them do the most unlikely things, the most unlikely things to... Um, accomplish his purpose. We can go through the healing of Naaman, the Syrian, from leprosy by washing the muddy river seven times and all that. Jericho, here's the, here's the stronghold of the most powerful tribe of the seven tribes that uh, control the land, and they're going to go and we'll march around the wall and blow trumpets. The ultimate foolishness of God. What is the most absurd idea that the entire universe would be saved by nailing the son of a carpenter to a couple of wooden beams crucified on a hill in Judea some 1,900 years ago. Preaching of the cross is to them that perish what? Foolishness. How interesting it is that God's foolishness is wiser than men and God's weakness is stronger than men. But anyway, we have here an example of what would seem to us a strange mechanic that God uses to preserve this child, this three-month-old child, um, uh, for his destiny. And interestingly, what a strange coincidence it is, <laughs> what a strange coincidence it is that he gets picked up by Pharaoh's daughter. As all of you know, there are no coincidences in the scripture. Hebrews 2.10 says, by whom are all things done and so forth. And uh, we know from 
Josephus, by the way, a very interesting thing, that Pharaoh's daughter was probably Thermotus, who had no other offspring. And by her adopting Moses, he was heir to the throne. You know, we all are familiar with the movie, The Ten Commandments. The interesting thing that may surprise you is most of that was based on excellent research. This whole concept of him being a rival for the throne against a natural but junior son may have some substance to it relative to the writings of uh, Josephus and others. And so that I the idea that Mo we're going to find from the scripture that he refused the throne. The one, there's some things that the movie takes violence with in terms of real spiritual understanding of the situation. But we're going to discover that this idea of Moses being not just taken care of by Pharaoh, but being heir to the throne uh, has, a, has a basis in the scripture. We could get into a whole thing here, by the way. It was it appropriate for Moses' parents to avoid? I mean, if they knew that the, the babe was, had a destiny in God's will, was it right for them to seek means to avoid him being killed? There's a whole issue here. You know, some of us as Christians say, well, gee, I know God, if it's God's will, I'm immune, right? That wasn't Christ's attitude. In Luke 4, verse 30, and John 8, verse 59, and other places, you'll notice that Christ, with all his knowledge, often would resort to normal means to avoid a confrontation, even though he knew he, knew he would win the confrontation. And uh, there are a number of cases where he was an extremis, and he would slip away. Without a miracle or a clash of thunder or earthquakes and stuff, he would just resort to reasonable means to avoid the problem, even though he had foreknowledge to know that it was in the cosmic destiny for him not to be taken at that point. So this whole business of using lawful means to avoid danger is very reasonable, even for one who is called by God to a mission. This also means that civil authorities are to be defied when their actions are clearly contrary to the manifest express intention of God in the situation. So we could draw many lessons from this, but in the interest of time, we'll keep moving on. Verse 11, and it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown. Now, gee, we've just leaped over a lot of issues. Before we get to verse 11, let's, let, there's some things between verses 10 and 11 that should be pointed out. Was Moses saved during his youth? Probably not. I think that's, we don't know, it's a fair thing. Was God's supernatural hand on him to preserve him? From that, we can draw the inference that God is able to preserve the elect through their unregeneracy. Interesting idea. Let me turn to Jude. First verse in the, the epistle of Jude. Jude was a brother of Christ. Both James and Jude were his brothers according to Matthew 13 and Mark 6 and what have you. Uh, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ, the brother of James, to them who are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Mercy and peace and love be multiplied. In the Greek construction of Jude's gospel, those verbs are very critical, very important, and in the right order. You are sanctified, preserved, and called in that order. Very interesting idea. I like to emphasize that, lest you think you had much to do with it. In Job chapter 5, verse 13, we know the Lord taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And we see that here. Pharaoh's own schemes to kill the babes is not only thwarted, but his enemy, if he knew who he was, is in his own household. He's providing the lodging, the food, the schooling, the protection, the, all the accoutrements of the court are being granted to his daughter's adopted son. So the very man that really is his intended adversary is uh, being preserved by Pharaoh's own resources, which I think is kind of interesting. Uh, we know a lot of uh, the interval here, and it might be worth doing it. We looked at Acts chapter 7. That commented briefly on this period. It said in cha Acts chapter 7, verse 22, it says, And Moses was learned in the, all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and he was mighty in words and deeds. And when he was a full 40 years old, he came into his heart to visit his brethren and the children of Israel and so forth. And tells how he oppressed and smote the Egyptian, and we're going to come to that in a minute. And um, he supposed his brethren w would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them, but they understood not. It recounts this whole issue that we're about to read. You might hold your finger here because we'll come back to that. But also I wanted to call your attention to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 24. Remember, we picked up verse 23 about the parents of Moses listed there. Let's pick up verse 24. It says, By faith, 
Hebrews 11.24, By faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Meaning he declined the throne, or his right to the throne of Egypt. Choosing rather to suffer the affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. He esteemed the reproach of Christ. How interesting. You trying to tell me that Moses was informed? That's what it says. He did this by faith, not dumb luck, not by blind choice, by faith, meaning he somehow understood. He chose, it was a knowledgeable choice, rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy pleasure of sin for a seeing, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater than the riches, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. Strange thing. Verse 28, though, through faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. And it goes on. Well, verse 29, by faith they passed through the Red Sea as dry land, which the Egyptians attempting to do were drowned. Okay, verse 11, it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown, that he went out unto his brethren and looked upon their burdens, and he observed an Egyptian smiting a Hebrew, one of his brethren. He looked this way and that way, and when he saw that there was no man, he slew the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. Moses didn't mess around. <coughs> when he went out to the second day, he went out the second day. Now, this isn't a week or two later for the rumor mill to get going. I remember that Ford Motor Company had a campaign many years ago about their car. It said, swift as a rumor and silent as a secret. You know, and I always thought that was very descriptive. Yeah, swift as a rumor. The next day, when he went out, behold, two men of the Hebrews, they were arguing. They strove together. And he said to them that did the wrong, wherefore smitest thou thy fellow? Now, he intervenes. These two guys have an argument, and he steps in to try to take sides, I guess. And he said, who made thee a prince and a judge over us? Intendest thou to kill me as thou didst kill the Egyptian? That shook him up. Because he steps into this argument, he gets hit with this, and they obviously know the word's gotten out that he killed this Egyptian. He would have expected them to be grateful, right? Not so. Moses feared and said, Surely the thing is known. Now when Pharaoh heard this thing, he sought to slay Moses. But Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. And he ends up in Midian, by the way, 40 years. That's a long time to be on the bench. <laughs> You're taken out of the game waiting. You can make an interesting study of how many of the great men of God were on the bench 40 years before they're called into service. A lot of them. A lot of them. Most of them. It's also an interesting study is to discover how many people meet an important gal by a well. <laughs> Remember Eliezer in Genesis 24? How Eliezer finds Rebecca where? By a well, right? Where does Rebecca finally meet Isaac? By the well of Lahai Roy, the living water. Of course, we all know the woman of the, by the well in Samaria and um, so forth. So it's kind of interesting that uh, he's by a well. So I guess if you're in the Old Testament and you're trying to meet the right girl, you do it by the water. Um, I guess just like today during coffee break, I suppose. Huh? Um, verse 16. Now, by the way, this, pray, you might, uh, this might be the right place to... Um, well, it, we, we, you can take Acts 7 and, and amplify it on your own because I'm, I'm going to try to see if we can't get through this chapter before we, the time runs out. Now, the priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came and drew water and filled the troughs to water their father's flock. And the shepherds came and drove them away. But Moses stood up and helped them and watered their flock. And when they came to Reel, or Regal, there's a couple of uh, Reguel, there's a different 
pronunciations perhaps, their father, he said, how is it that ye are come so soon today? In other words, they finished early because they had help, see? They said, an Egyptian delivered us out of the hand of the shepherds and also drew water enough for us and watered the flock. And he said unto his daughters, and where is he? Why is it that ye have left the man? Call him that he may eat bread. Yeah, a man with seven daughters is anxious to find out who this guy is. Yeah. <laughs> Verse 21, and Moses was content to dwell with the man. And he gave Moses, Zipporah, his daughter. And she bore him a son. And he called his name Gershom. And he said, for I have been an alien in a foreign land. So Moses misses home. He's away 40 years total. I'm always fascinated by the fact that um, we have seven daughters. One of them is his Gentile bride. So you can make something of that or not, depending on your mood. There's no great um, significance of that to some. I think it's interesting. It's the kind of thing that I find personally fascinating. Verse 23, and it came to pass in, pro in the process of time that the king of Egypt died and the children of Israel sighed by reason of the bondage and they cried and their cry came up unto God by reason of the bondage. And God heard their groaning and remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And God looked upon the children of Israel and God knew their plight. That's where we'll stop. Next time, we'll try to take chapter 3. And we'll try to maybe carry it through chapter 4, 3 and 4. Very, very interesting, interesting episode forthcoming. Next time, we're going to take this whole issue of the burning bush. Some of it will be familiar to you. There's probably a few things that we'll point out that may not be quite so familiar. If we study Isaiah 6 and Acts 9 and other passages, you can come to the conclusion that a vision of the glory of God seems to be a prerequisite to unusual service. And that seems to be what we're going to run into here. We're going to be fascinated with the consistency of idiom. You may say, gee, there's no burning bush anywhere else in the scripture. What do you mean consistency? It's a very unique thing. Not really. It combines idioms in what might be regarded as the most remarkable pun in the scripture. We'll talk about that next time. The Lord recruits him for service. He tries every conceivable objection he can. But what's probably going to be the most interesting thing is how God lays out exactly what he's going to do and exactly what the result will be. As you read, pay attention to the assertiveness and the lack of ambiguity in God's language. How very specifically, how very assertively. Even verse 19, he says, I am sure that the king will not let you go. He lays it out for Moses right up front that he's going to go into this negotiation and it ain't going to work at first until God's really ready. And the whole point of it will be to demonstrate some very interesting things. Anyway, um, our time is finished. I think the book of Exodus can be a fun book of prophecy. I think we'll... We'll have a chance to dig out some rich blessings. I hope, hope you can continue with us, and let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we praise you for your redemption of ourselves, Father. We thank you that you have, pres that you have sanctified us from the beginning and that you have preserved us even before we knew you. We praise you, Father, that your redemptive plan on our behalf is so pervasive, so complete. We would ask you, Father, to just open our understanding, increase, an, increase our appetite for these things. Help us to understand what you have done for us. Help us to understand what you would have of us day to day, week to week, in the time ahead. For we ask all these things that we might be pleasing in thy sight, that we might be more pleasing servants of your great gifts, that we might come to better know 
our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.